It's Thursday night, 8 o'clock. Time for Cinema Hits and Misses. I'm Dawn. And I'm John. And I'm Aaron. And we're here live on WMPG 90.9 FM and WMPG.org, 8830. And as Justine said, if you want to give us a call, talk about the movies, we're at 780-4909, 780-4909. John, what do you want to kick it off with tonight? Uh, sure. So the first film we'll kick off with is the Warner Brothers animated film Storks. So, storks are known as birds that deliver babies, or at least that's what they used to do. Now they deliver packages for cornerstore.com. Junior, the company's best stork, is up for a promotion. He only has to do one thing, which is to fire the only human who lives with the storks, a young girl named Tulip. Junior has difficulties with that and sends Tulip, Tulip to be a letter sorter. Tulip is at first enthusiastic with her new job until the boredom takes over. Eventually, a, a letter arrives from a young boy asking for a baby brother, so Tulip turns turns on the baby-making machine, and Junior tries to t- stop the machine, and he injures his wing in the process. But the machine still works, and a baby is made. Now, Junior, with the help of Tulip, has to go deliver the baby before his boss notices, and his chances of promotion are gone. And this is a film directed by Nicholas Stoller and Doug Sweetland, and stars Andy Samberg, Kelsey Grammer, Katie Crown, Jennifer Aniston, Ty Burrell, Keegan-Michael Key, and Jordan Peele. It has a 63% on Rotten Tomatoes, and 72%, 72% of audiences liked it. And I like the wolves. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I so I came in with like absolutely no expectations. I, th- I hadn't seen much of anything. I, I don't even think I watched the trailer. So I just thought, I'm like, eh, this is probably not going to be good, right? I didn't, yeah. I didn't set the bar that high, but... I actually ended up liking it a lot more than I thought I was going to. Now, granted, it's definitely not the best animated film I've seen this year. You know, it's no Kubo, uh, for <laughs> sure. But, like, it's still... I still had enjoyment with it. I think, for the most part, it it's super fast. I mean, it's fast-paced. It has some good laughs. It's just absurd. It's over the top. And that's... Like, they set that from the get-go. I mean, it's just... The whole premise is just odd, right? So I think that's why it kind of works. Just because, you know everything's over the top. There's just some things that just don't make sense at all, but since it's animated, like, you can kind of just let it slide because it's just, that's how they set it. Yeah. And I think having the veteran vocal talent, uh, Katie Crown as Tulip, the character who is just turned 18, her world's turned upside down, and she's trying to rectify it. I like that character, and I liked, um, is it Jasper? No, um, Junior. Their relationship, how they're trying to fix it. Um, we were talking off air. I always look at these movies and try to wonder, you know, who is the audience for? Because on one hand, you look at animated movies as kids' movies, because they're quote-unquote cartoons, but more and more they're geared towards the adults, because it's the adults who will get the kids there and pay for stuff. So, you know, you, you've got um, two different two different opinions on this. And I know for the kid viewpoint uh the the showing that i had had younger kids in it and you know they they liked the colors they were kind of giggling at different spots the adults we kind of got some of the humor in it um but of course i think the the premise of it being about family ultimately and you know know your pack i think was one of the taglines yeah I, it might have been i don't actually remember the tagline <laughs> either so <laughs> But yeah, there's definitely a good theme of family. And there's kind of like this B plot line. I kind of mentioned that there's a young boy, and uh, you know his parents are kind of just occupied with their work constantly, and he like it's more just like a side plot. It's a B plot or whatever that term is. But it's just it's more like him trying to just connect with his family because they're just so distant because they're working. And I I enjoyed them trying that, but like in doing so, I just felt like sometimes like they're the parent characters were just going like off the walls crazy for no real reason like that's where the that's where the absurdity just kind of like you know took me out of it a little but not too much i think the more enjoyable part was when it was with you know junior and junior and tulip on their like little adventure just trying to get this baby delivered and the things they run into like the the wolves they run into are just absolutely the hilarious yeah. i thought that, that like that's my favorite part of the film right there yeah i'm sure ryan must have been going nuts there too with keegan michael key and uh jordan peele as the alpha and beta wolves oh yeah yeah they he, he was going <laughs> it was just ryan and i in our screening so we, we had a blast 
Yeah. And, you know, John, when you mentioned some things original, some things kind of derivative. Um, of course, the, the Stork Factory, kind of the Amazon-ish, but you've also got some corporate feeling from like the Lego movie or um, the Quest narrative is kind of the Shrek story or um, Inside Out, the parents. So there are themes that you know. So, you know, if you're comfortable and, and you want to be in kind of a comfortable movie, I'd say, sure, go see it. For me, I think having seen this after Kubo, you know, I think Kubo set my gold standard for quite a while for original stories and things that move along. This isn't bad, but having that as the my standard, this kind of kind of dinged a little bit. Yeah, I, I mean, I can certainly see why people would have issues with it. I mean, there's definitely, you know, there's like one thing where they somehow it just like the there's some plot device that just gets them to a certain location, like in a snap, you know, it's just like, and I understand more. That's just to move the story along. Mm -hmm. And, and I, and, you know, it just fits with the absurdity of it all. I think that's just kind of why I enjoy it, you know, because once they had set the foundation of how odd this is going to be, it, you know, it just worked for me through, through most of it. Yeah. Uh, you know, I like the performances. I thought Sandberg was good. Sandberg and crown worked great off each other. You know, they great interaction. Uh, Kelsey Grammer, I've always been a fan of him since I watched Frasier a couple years back. <laughs> you know, he he fit the role perfectly, but wasn't like this is amazing kind of performance thing. He he fit it well. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, I think this is it's um, certainly suitable for families. I think um, the kids that I saw in the in the theater were ranged from probably kindergarten because one girl's probably around five to someone who was like around eight or nine. And, so, you know, so they they were there. They seemed to do well with it. I don't know if they would get the undercurrent on it, but certainly the older kids would get this in. You know, we're adults. We kind of liked it. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I, if you're looking for an animated film and if Kubo, for some reason, is not around, I believe it still is because um, Kubo certainly has, deals with, you know, some darker themes. So if you're looking for something a little bit more lighthearted, I'd say go watch Storks. Yeah, and if you're just tuning in, you've got Cinema Hits and Misses here on WMPG. This is Dawn with John and Aaron. We're talking about storks, and we're going to be talking about The Magnificent Seven in a few minutes. If you want to give us a call, we're live till late 30 at 780-4909. That's 780-4909. Um, you know, again, I, I keep going back to the wolves, because that was just... The way they were written to throw yeah kind of throw a wrench in the works on how they are met everyone's mesmerized by babies so it was funny how they took the premise that everyone kind of gets almost hypnotized by baby aura so they didn't want to take they didn't want to take the baby out of the capsule and when they did of course you make eye contact and you get hypnotized and you know that happened with the wolves and of course they wanted to make it part of the pack so i mean as part as the family theme, I think that, for me, really exemplified, you know, taking in someone that's not of your own and make it a part of your pack. Whereas Tulip, there's a reason that she's with the Storks, which we're not going to give away. Cause... No, of course not. You can't give spoilers. <laughs> nobody wants spoilers. No, no, no. Because no. there's one actor you didn't mention here, and people might know him more for non-animated movies, Danny Trejo. Yeah, yeah. As Jasper. Yeah, I mean, there were, there's a lot of people in the cast. And I, when I was writing the summary, I'm like, just who, where do I stop the line? You know, I know, I know. I can't, I can't include everybody. <laughs> Too much. I, there's, just, yeah, there's just a lot. I mean, it, I, I thought the cast did well with what they were given. Uh, there, there weren't any like you know clear standouts, but I mean, they, they fit it. So. Yeah, and you know the. Can't even think of the name of the. There was another anime movie that was released this past weekend too that. Didn't was there? do. Oh, the Robinson Caruso. Um, oh, the wildlife the wild. that came out like what a few weeks ago, and so. it just kind of I think it's disappeared now from at least the Westbrook Cinemagic. Yeah, so you know I think this one will stick around for a while. I mean, it might take a little bump with something we may talk about within next week or the week after, Miss Peregrine. Yeah, maybe, possibly. We it's difficult to say. Yeah, so you know it's nice to have a movie that will hit multiple generations. And, you know, that if a family can go to. So this one's a family-friendly one. And, you know, for me, it'd be like, see it as a matinee or wait for home viewing. But, 
you know, if you want a chance to get out and enjoy film together, sure. Yeah, I, I agree with Don entirely. Matinee or, or wait for DVD if you're not interested, but there it's definitely it's a good animated film for families. Yeah, so anything else about Stork, Storks, John? No, I think we covered everything. All right. So next up we have The Magnificent Seven. Now Aaron's got a summary for synopsis for yes. this one. <laughs> All right. So The Magnificent Seven is directed by Antoine Fuqua and is a retelling of the original 1960 Western. The plot centers on the small town of Rose, que- uh, Rose Creek. When the sinister industrialist Bartholomew B- Borg, played by Peter Skarsgård, takes, o- takes the- over the town by force, resident Emma Cullen, played by Haley Bennett, seeks the services of bounty hunter Sam Chisholm, played by Denzel Washington. Agreeing to try to take down Borg and his expansive army of goons, Chisholm is joined by six other deadly men. Josh Faraday, played by Chris Pratt. Red Harvest, played by Martin Sinsmister. Uh, Goodnight Robichaud, played by Ethan Hawke. Billy, Ho- Billy Rocks, played by Byung Hung Lee. Vasquez, played by Manuel Garcia Ruffalo. And Jack Horn, played by Vincent D'Onofrio. Together, the seven must work together, as well as try to inspire the citizens of Rose Creek to take back their home. The film has a 62% critic score on Rotten Tomatoes, and 80% of audience members liked it. I think I'd probably in that, between that 62 to 80%. Yeah. You know, not 100%, <laughs> but this one's not a bad film. Yeah. Maybe. I think the tough thing is you're, you're holding it to that magnificent title and the memories of the magnificent movie, which is actually a remake of a different movie, um, mm. The Seven Samurai, Kurosawa. Right. Um, you know, talking about Seven Ronin. I mean, you have the theme running through all of these, and, you know, whether or not you liked the MGM version of from the 60s, this one you might want to give a try, I think. Yeah. yeah it's... There are plot... I could drive a truck through some of the plot points, <laughs> holes in the plot points, but, you know, overall, I was I was pretty happy with it. Yeah, uh, to me, it, it just felt like, a, you know, it felt like a summer blockbuster, in a sense. It it was just, you know, good old popcorn eating fun. Uh, and now I haven't seen, you know, the original or Seven Samurai. So really it was just looking at it on its own. And I think the, the action, really the standout are like the action sequences, particularly, you know, closer to the end. And what Fuqua does a good job with is like just showing us as many different, like as many different angles of the town as possible. So when the chaos just goes, you kind of have an idea where everybody is. Like, in a similar sense, like, I would compare it, I mean, not entirely, but, like, in the sense of, like, with Captain America Civil War, the air, the airport scene. You have an idea where everybody is within the town, and so you don't get lost in the confusion. Because it, it just, it keeps going, but it's it's pretty entertaining. No, I totally get that, man. Like, with the, with the action scenes, like, that was definitely a highlight. But what I really liked, too, was uh, the cast. Like, each of the actors really, even though a lot of them weren't written necessarily, like, with a lot of layers, I thought that the different cast members kind of brought a unique personality and like to their roles. Uh, whether it be um, just like Denzel Washington, he's like always amazing, um, or just each of the characters, they were really cool. You know, I think um, one of the strengths here is that um, Washington and Fuqua have worked together a couple right. of times, and like in Training Day, Ethan Hawke was in it with Denzel Washington, and then the equalizer, um, Haley Bennett, was in it. So there's that probably bit of shorthand they've had in in direction, which I think serves it well here. You know, and none of these characters have a real rich backstory. You get snippets of the Chisholm character, and of course, just the name Chisholm, you guys may or may not know this, evokes the John Wayne persona. I mean, John Wayne's Chisholm series so you've got that western you know um bravado and i think they were smart not to use the name chris which was the yul brenner role in the 1960s version of magnificent seven in the spinoff so it was nice to distance itself that way and you know of course it had a you know you had the various backgrounds of the cast you know you had the um, Gung Hung Lee, who was Asian fighter and, of course, the quips of how he's pulling his weapons out of his hair. 
you know, and the, and the D'Onofrio character talking about being resembling a bear, or is, is it a bear wearing a man suit, or the lines are... <laughs> and even the Chris Pratt role harkens back to Steve McQueen's kind of card-sharp um, wisecracker. And it looks like we have a caller. We've got Duke. It is. <laughs> hey, Duke. How are you? Good. You know, I was, uh, of course, just there uh, for my show, but I was listening to you on my way home, and I couldn't resist calling in to say what my um, concern is with this movie. Having not even seen it, I have no interest in seeing it, uh, just because it repeats that Western motif of, of the 60s movie. Um, you know, as you noted, uh, the Magnificent Seven that we're all familiar with was based on the Kurosawa film um, Seven Samurai. Mm-hmm. And I think this reiteration, instead of using the Western setting, should have, you know, maybe set it in the Middle East and call it Seven Soldiers or or done maybe, you know, the Magnificent Seven in space. You know, <laughs> I, I, I would have been all over that. <laughs> but I just have no interest in seeing this movie. Um, just because it feels like uh, a retread, just even just based on the trailers. And, and you know, I guess I'm, I'm looking for you folks to sort of convince me why I, I should go see this when I feel like I'm just going to sit there and negatively compare it to the classic uh, cowboy western we're all familiar with. You know, I, I think I was in the same camp with you, Duke. Of course, I would say the Kurosawa is a classic. I don't know if the Magnificent Seven from MGM... It was a good movie, but when you look at that compared to, say, you know, the good, the bad, the ugly, you know, though the Sergio Leone type movies, those are certainly more of a golder standard than the Magnificent Seven of the 60s. This one, a little bit, I think probably, actually, the actor I didn't mention was um, probably the Peter Skarsgård character, Sarsgaard, who is a mine operator who goes into the village he's the reason why the villagers go after look for hope from somebody now um, in the mgm film the um the sort of the eighth character is the theme song yeah <laughs> <laughs> does, does does this movie have you know as good uh, or, or, or as pulse pounding a, a theme is that one well that's um elmer bernstein's original score and it's actually hinted at through and then plays at the end so it's not original uh, so it they they've taken the the music they they've repurposed the music on this so you'll have that memory in there ah. all right well thanks thanks for listening to me and I'll uh, I'll hang up and and listen to you folks uh, okay. I'll get on safe the radio now. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> thanks dude thank you you know and to to do's point the the earlier version of course had um, was set in a Mexican town with two warring factions, and most of the gunslingers were American. So I think kind of the step up here is that it's set a it's more business business and settlers, and the people who are coming in this group of bandits that um, Chisholm pulls together a wide variety of backgrounds and reasonings for helping out. I mean, some more than others, I think. That's one of my few issues with it is that, you know, some characters just just join out of, you know, like this really obscure reasoning. And, like, and I get it, but sometimes I, did, I didn't buy it all the time. Like, well, you know, why would certain characters be there? Uh, you know, definitely for Ethan Hawke's character, Goodnight Robichaud, is definitely, like, you know, him and Chisholm have a background together, so you can completely understand that. It just... Some work, some don't, and that's how I felt with, like, a majority of the cast. You know, like, some characters felt like they were definitely more developed than others, and it's probably just because, you know, it's, you know, the star power, therefore they get more screen time. I'm not certain of that, but that's just how it felt like, you know, because Washington and Pratt took up a majority of the screen time. To me, that's what it felt like. Um, and while other characters could have definitely used some some more development, I think it's it it's fine. But, it, you know, they could have done more. But the movie already goes over, like, two hours, I believe, right? Yeah. 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 So, I mean, it, it took them a little bit to get going to. And so I think it's it's a difficult task, you know, trying to get such a large cast and trying to get them as developed as possible. But I think with the time that Fuqua had, he he did a good job. And, you know, it's, really, to me, it was just all about the action. I mean, No, I get that. I think the movie does a good job at 
kind of hinting just enough like below the surface of these characters so even though you don't really have a lot of time to uh get to know these characters you can kind of imagine a backstory um even without seeing it yeah the it that we're talking about is the magnificent seven currently playing in theaters and you know if you want to join your voice into the conversation like duke just did you can give us a call at 780-4909 that's 780-4909 we run here on Cinema Hits and Misses until 8.30. Now, you know, it poses a good question. For somebody who, like Duke, grew up with probably more classic Westerns, this may not be the strongest, but I've, I've heard mixed of kind of the same generation. Um, I mean, we had a woman come up to us afterwards, and she said she liked it better than the, first, the original, which is an interesting uh, viewpoint. But, yeah, I don't... I don't really know. We didn't really get that many reactions to determine like how people feel about it. You know, if if I'm looking at modern westerns, of course, either set in the old west or modern day. Of course, we did Hell or High Water recently, which I think is a a very well written modern western. And then a couple of years ago, there was a remake, Three Ten to Yuma, with Russell Crowe and Christian Bale. I think did you know were superior to this but you know so if you're if you're looking at your budgeting dollar i i would see this if you want to see the landscape and the shots because i think fuqua did some great shots on this oh yes for sure you know there there are some there's some plot there's some shots that i can't describe because we don't want to give spoilers away my probably my biggest pet peeve would be um, the armaments that they used and um, how some of the things, especially with um, Goodnight Robichaux's character played out with his skill and weaponry and what he may or may not have been able to do. You know, and, you know, mm-hmm. so during the fight, you know, there's, there's things. But, you know, again, and if, and if you've seen um, Silverado and the Danny Glover ca- character, you'll get what I mean. Um so, I mean, this is, I think, serviceable. If you hold the 1960s movie high in esteem, this may suffer in comparison. So, yeah, probably Duke, you want to save your dollars. Um, but if you want to see something kind of repurposing and a little bit more of an update, it's not a bad film. And I think of remakes, especially this summer, that we've seen a lot of bad remakes. Oh, oh boy. Or even sequels, too. But yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I can't really say, like I said earlier, I can't really say in comparison to the original, because I still have yet to see it. It's definitely on my list for sure, and Seven <laughs> Samurai. But for, I think it's just, it's literally just a, it's a blockbuster, summer blockbuster that just got placed in September for some reason. And so if you're just looking for some, some good old fun, I think you'll have it with Magnificent Seven. But if you really don't want to see it, then you can wait. That's perfectly fine. Yeah, I think the same thing as these guys. If you just want to see like a cool movie with awesome action, fun characters, uh, tense gun battles, then I think you're going to have a lot of fun with this one. You know, and one of the things I appreciate, I and mean, the Chris Pratt character may seem, the uh, Josh Faraday, may seem a little bit out of place, but it helps with lightening up the mood. And there are times that you need some of the, the mood lightened here. And, you know... Um, I lost his name. Um, Sennheiser. Um, the one who played Red Harvest? Is... Yes. So Red Harvest had an awkward introduction, but there's one... The purpose of it was this one scene, which ends up being probably a very important scene in the film. So again, he's a, he's kind of this plot point character that moves the story along. Um, the Jack Horn character could probably be the same. Their relationship... And, you know, what happened to him and, and actually D'Onofrio, people are kind of dinging his his voice in this. It was a very affected voice. Um, I guess when he went in to uh, do the role, he had asked Fuqua if he wanted to hear the voice he thought about it. And Fuqua said, no, you, roll, you run with it. And he has a pretty unique vo- voice in this film. Yeah, yeah it definitely it. surprised me at first. <laughs> So it's kind of those surprise moments that happen. And, you know, Peter Sarsgaard, I think, is probably one of the 
most interesting bad guys running these days. You know, very flemmy. Yeah, I mean, I thought Sarsgaard was good, but definitely, like, his villain's very one note in a sense. To me, it seemed like. But, I mean, I guess that's just kind of how it fits the time, or the, the westerns, right? I mean, I haven't seen too many westerns, but, you know, the villains always just seem to be one note. I mean, they, they definitely could be more to it, but, you know, Sarsgaard played it fine. Yeah. So while we've got a couple minutes here, um, Magnificent Seven, again, I think for me it's, I wanted to see it in the theater because I wanted to see the large scale and, and kind of the Western vistas, but certainly it could, could wait for home viewing. I don't know what you guys. I mean, we both said it must see for yeah. Our, yeah. our free press review. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I'd go see Death of Theaters just because the, like the action and the scale, it, it'd just be fun to see on screen. Great. Now, wanted to give you a probably a reminder. We probably mentioned this earlier in the year. Um, often we talk about Damnation Land, and we've got some updates on times and screenings coming up. Yep. So looks like there will be premieres going on at the State Theater in Portland on Friday, October fourteenth, at the Nickelodeon Cinemas in Portland on Monday, October seventeenth, the Frontier Cafe in Brunswick on Thursday, October twenty seventh. Friday, October 28th, Saturday, October 29th, and Sunday, October 30th. It'll also be, other premieres are the Levitt Theater in Ogunquit on the 28th of October, the Gem in Bethel at uh, on Saturday, October 29th, and at the Apple Cinemas in Cambridge, Massachusetts. I think I covered everything. Yeah, they were, yeah. Um, the, <laughs> one, the one in Massachusetts here. is a kind of a retrospective, so that's kind of interesting. So... It, our signal can reach as far as Massachusetts. So if you're down in that area, <laughs> you can hit it. Um, and, you know, I would advocate for any of those showings. But if you have the time, I would go for the premiere because the crew from Damnation Land always put something extra in that premiere. Usually some live performances or entertainment that's worth catching out. And there's a website that you can go for more information i think yes uh for more information you go to www.damnationland.com slash screenings there you go so next week i know we're talking about deep water horizon we're we're still talking about the the second movie yeah uh, to be to be continued to be continued and um in the meantime just genius here getting ready for between the notes with some great jazz to take you through the rest of the evening thanks guys